Good morning, everyone. I'm Stephen Holland, along with my wife, Karen. We're the pastors at the Salvation Army in Chatham, Ontario. I'd like to welcome you here this morning. Um, our church is still uh, closed as we prepare to uh, set up for restrictions and uh, the challenge that, that takes place with coming back uh, as a worship gathering uh, in the future. And so uh, I'll let you know as congregants uh, when that will take place down the road. A letter will be sent out to each and every one of you to explain some of the restrictions when you do arrive. But for right now, uh, for the next few Sundays at least, uh, this will be our means of worship on Sunday. And so I encourage you to follow through to the end and uh, leave a comment, leave a, a thumbs up, leave a, a remark. Uh, it's nice to hear from you and it's nice to just uh, know that uh, you're listening. And if you want to be a friend on my Facebook, by all means do. And then you can message me if you have a prayer request or a concern in your life. Uh, I look forward to uh, getting back together with you. But for now, this is the way we uh, currently worship together. And so uh, let's just um, bow our heads and uh, I'll have a prayer with you. Father God, just bless the people who are listening this morning. May they experience you in a new way. May they feel your presence even as they sit and watch this online. I pray you touch their lives and meet their needs. And I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit will be amongst them. In Christ's name, amen. As we continue on, you'll hear a couple of songs from Terry Barker. Um, he's a beautiful singer and nice guitar player. And uh, I hope you'll be blessed. Hope you'll be blessed by his uh, music, his talents, and by the message given this morning. I just uh, thank you for joining us. And again, share this with others if you'd like. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. To the earth you created All for love's sake become poor So here I am to worship Here I am to bow down Here I am to say that you're my God You're all together lovely All together worthy All together
morning, everyone. It's nice to be with you this morning on July 26th. Uh, it's been a lot of hot weather the last uh, few weeks, and, and so I'm looking forward to uh, it cooling down eventually. Uh, this morning, we're going to be, or I'm going to be talking about uh, the title, We Are Not Limited by Our Labels. Uh, each one of us uh, gets labeled sometimes, and, and sometimes that can hurt our, our relationships and hurt us. And so we're going to talk about what labels uh, really mean in our lives. If you want to turn to Exodus 2, 1 to 10 and follow along, it's the story about Moses. And so we'll look at uh, uh, just a little bit about uh, who Moses was and, and some of the labels that were placed on him and how... Uh, he could have been limited, but God was really in control of his life. You know, it's been five months since everything shut down, or at least close to five months shut down because of COVID-19. Uh, businesses and stores and movie theaters and churches and restaurants have all been closed. and Slowly, we're starting to open back up with uh, a lot of restrictions, and, and it becomes uh, difficult. And now, as we enter stage three, uh, we have been uh, looking at how we will open the back up as a church. And uh, for some people, life is starting to look a little normal, whatever normal is, because it's not normal to have to wear a mask in the Costco. And if you didn't wear one, I'm sure the staff would be hollering at you to put one on, or you wouldn't be able to stay. It's not normal to walk down a grocery store aisle having to find, follow the arrows. For direction and try going the wrong way one time and you'll hear somebody say something to you it's happened to me and so the, the world has become a strange and scary place to some extent you know how bad is COVID in the lives of people well some people say it's not that bad but if your loved one was getting sick and it has potential to die then COVID is bad and so we really have to be careful in how we reopen, and uh, even in the church, how we reopen and what that looks like. You know, we've been told we won't be able to sing, we won't be able to gather together, we have to sit separately from our, our uh, bubble. We have no handshaking, no hugging, uh, no pen, no uh, order of service being handed out. The only person to sing is the one person who's leading the song, and that person has to wear a mask, and you have to stay 12 people from the 12 feet. Of, away from the guitar player or the piano and so there's so many restrictions that will need to be put in place it's not going to look like a normal church that's for sure but isn't it in times of crisis where people have turned to god and turned to the church you know people need to know find comfort and peace and encouragement and forgiveness in times of strife because we need to know that in this uncontrollable life of COVID-19 or whatever happens around us, that God is ultimately in control. And that's why the church is there sometimes. That's why people go to church, to know that God is in control. You know, if you look back at 9-11, the churches after that, that tragedy, uh, after that happened, a lot of people went to church for several weeks because they needed to know that God was there. And so uh, in these times, now where uh, COVID is rampant, people are dying and sickness is around. Where do we turn if we can't turn to the church? If we can't gather together to mourn or to sing his songs and to worship? And sure, I can put a message up online on Sundays, but I don't think it can replace uh, gathering together as a community. And I don't think it will ever replace that. We need to be in community. But I must admit, uh, part of me feels guilty about having the church closed. I wonder, do I really trust the government to tell me what to do and when and how we are to worship? Do I really put my trust and faith in God to protect us? Do I label myself as weak and lacking faith? Do I trust the government more than I trust my God? I heard a pastor online talk about how churches should never have closed and should not have any restrictions in place. The pastor labeled those of us who closed our churches as truly not believing and trusting in God. He labels us as left wing and he says we are like sheep being led by a corrupt left wing government. 
He says that the world and Satan are trying to destroy the church, and we are allowing it to happen by keeping our doors closed. He labels me and other pastors and leaders of churches as complicit in Satan's work. Now, I don't believe that's true. I think what this pastor is speaking about is uh, represents how he doesn't feel God is really in control. You know, do I have to be in church to have God in my life? No, but it helps. It helps to find spiritual growth. It helps to to uh, to uh, come together with people who are like minded. But that can be done anywhere. God is in control ultimately, whether we're in church or not. But it's easy to place labels on people, especially from your high perch. I think about when we were in school, when you went to uh, high school or uh, university, we labeled other students as jocks. They were the ones who were involved in the sports and, and walked around uh, kind of preppy. And they were the jocks. And then there were the nerds or there were people who were classed as smart or there was a, the teacher's pet. Now, I was not called any of those. I was just somebody in the classroom. Maybe we even remember the feeling of having our identity reduced to a stereotype. But now, as adults, I suspect many of us still feel labeled today. They haven't gone away. Those labels are still there. We don't necessarily say the labels out loud, but there are still some things we may be known for some group we fall into, or uh, some things that define our identities, and it still makes us feel like we're being labeled. As a Salvation Army officer myself, I wear a uniform and uh, the label of the crest on here. You can see it. And so I, I have labels on me. As a pastor, I have a label on me. And uh, people see me in the community, and so if they see me in my uniform or a Salvation Army, they say, oh, there's a man from Salvation Army. It's a label. It's as if sometimes, though, uh, these labels can cause us, and not particularly a Salvation Army label, but other labels we place in ourselves and our identities, uh, they don't fit in with us sometimes, or they don't let us measure up to what we want to be, and they, they, they show some kind of defect in us. Maybe you're labeled as an alcoholic or a drug addict, or you're labeled uh, uh, as a bad father or a bad mother or lazy, or good for nothing, or nothing but a homeless bum. You know, we can put labels on people very easily. But maybe your label also revolves around your job. Like I said, mine does. I'm a pastor. And so as a pastor, there's a certain expectation, certain uh, way I'm supposed to act in the community. Maybe you work in IT and you're viewed as a nerd. Maybe you sell cars for a living. And, uh, there's a stereotype of not being trustworthy and maybe a little even aggressive, especially if you work on commission. Or maybe you've always been a, a homemaker and you know there's a stereotype around that. You know, some homemakers are thought of as being uh, not doing nothing but laying around watching TV and eating all day. Now, I know that's not true. Moms and dads who stay home with their families is a tough job and one that is, well, um, looked up to in my eyes, but uh, some people don't see it that way. And so there can be a label on that kind of position you hold in your family. Sometimes we even label, have labels in our families. Maybe you're known as the funny one or the sarcastic one. I tend to think I am the funny one and the sarcastic one in my family. Maybe you're known as the vulnerable one one who always cries and sheds tears, or maybe you're the fixer. You fix relationships in your family, or maybe uh, you're the one that goes around and fixes uh, the, the housing projects that need to be done or uh, pipes that, need, that are leaking. Maybe you're that kind of a fixer in your family. Maybe you're the sibling that has a negative opinion about everyone in the family. There's always one of those. I have six brothers and sisters, and so we all have these kind of mix of labels. Maybe you're known as the favorite child. Or you're clearly not the favorite one. You're known as the black sheep of the family. There's another label that we place on people. Black sheep of the family. Why is it black sheep? Why is it not known as the white sheep of the family? You see, we, we place labels to cause negativity. Because that's what we like to do. You see, no matter how we are labeled, each of us probably has a label identifying who we are. 
Yet the reality is, no matter what we do or what people of, or group we are gathered with, we're going to get labeled as something. And that's not always a bad thing, because it's nice to be known as the smart one or the fun one or the nice one. But at the same time, labels can hurt and make us feel stuck in our life, in our situation. However, sometimes labels aren't even placed on us by others. We seem to label ourselves. We think we aren't smart enough or we can't do that. Uh, I don't have the ability to do that because I'm this or I can't do that because I'm only this. And so we tend to feel stuck in our situation in our life because ultimately labels can control our story, our life story. But what if we didn't have to be defined or limited by our labels? And so for the next few weeks, we're going to look at the life of Moses. Now Moses had labels placed on him that should have restricted him from even being alive. But we'll talk about that in a moment. Now, even if you don't know uh, about Moses, much about Moses, or you don't attend church regularly, chances are most of you have heard about him. You've seen the movie about him. Charlton Heston played Moses from an old black and white movie. And if you want to read about Moses' life, go to the Old Testament and uh, read the book of Exodus, and you'll learn a lot about Moses. Sometimes the movie shows a little different, but the, the Bible is uh, what actually happened. If you want to follow along, uh, please turn to Exodus 2, 1 to 10. Exodus 2, 1 to 10. So it begins by the Egyptians. The Egyptians are the ruling empire at this time in history. And as the ruling empire, they had slaves. These slaves were the Hebrew people. For Egypt to grow as a nation, a powerful nation, they needed slave labor to do the work. Because, and because of this, they needed these Hebrews to do their work, which was the slave labor, the hard stuff. But there was a problem. It seems the slave population or the Hebrew nation grew too large. So Egypt's leader, the Pharaoh, saw the growing Hebrew population as a threat to his kingdom. He believed that if there were too many of them, they'd ultimately rebel against the Egyptian masters. They would have a civil war and the Egyptians would lose if there was too many Hebrews. So with this fear in mind, uh, Pharaoh made a radical decree. He made a law. He said that going forward, every infant boy, every infant Hebrew boy would be killed. This crazy, cruel law ensured two things, that two things would happen. First, it was meant to slow down the population growth of the Hebrew nation. And secondly, Pharaoh believed it would instill fear in the slaves. And so being labeled a Hebrew was the worst thing that could have happened. It meant as an adult, you were a slave. And if you were a boy, baby boy, it meant you'd be killed, murdered, put to death. But it was during this cruelty that God had a plan to free the Hebrew people. And here's how the story went. This is where we meet the baby called Moses. It says a Hebrew mother had a baby boy and she desperately wanted to keep him alive. And so to save him, she put him in a watertight basket and hid him in the bushes on the Nile River. The basket was spotted by someone on the riverbank, but it wasn't spotted by just anyone. It was spotted by the Pharaoh's daughter, the princess. It says in Exodus 2, 5 and 6, the Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river and her attendants walked along the riverbank. And when the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she, she uh, got her maid to go after it. And when the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying and she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. So she took the baby from the riverbank and decided to raise him as her own. And she gave him the name Moses. Now, baby Moses became part of the, uh, the Pharaoh's family. Moses went from having the worst possible label placed on him, a Hebrew, a Hebrew boy, to having the best label anyone could ever have in their culture. Moses became part of the royal family, the royal household. What happened next seems straight out of a movie. You see, Pharaoh's daughter needed help raising Moses. 
After all, princesses don't raise children. Their handmaidens do. And their, their other women raise uh, babies of the daughter Pharaoh. And so she needed help. So she unknowingly hires Moses' actual birth mother. So not only did Moses' life change from a death sentence to a life in the royal household, but now his family's life, life changed as well. Now, over the next few weeks, we're going to talk a little bit more about Moses and how he grew up in Pharaoh's house. But as a preview, I'll say this. Moses became one of the most influential people in history. And not just in the religious world, but in all of history. And what's wild about this is that nobody could have seen it coming. Moses was born into a very specific label, a Hebrew this label didn't just limit his ability to get future job or to go to a certain place or to be around certain people. This label of Hebrew literally limited his ability to live. It meant death. But what, here's what I don't want you to miss. Moses may have been limited by his label, the label placed on him as a Hebrew, but God wasn't limited at all. There's, God doesn't put limits on things. Sure, being a Hebrew said something about Moses, but it didn't say everything. His background didn't have the final say. His family of origin didn't have the final say. The expectations for a young Hebrew boy was death. This didn't even have a final say. Instead, it was ultimately God's label of Moses that mattered most. And in the same way, our labels and our future are not confined to the labels that have been placed on us. Instead, the only label, the only viewpoint of us that really matters is how God sees us. The labels we place on ourselves does not limit God to act in our life. The labels others place on us does not limit God to act in our life. You see, closing the churches does not limit God to make a difference in people's lives. The restrictions placed on people do not limit God to change people's lives. You see, if COVID-19 limited God, then we label him as a failure and that he is not really in control and he is not powerful enough to deal with the problems we face. Even in this COVID, we can't place a limit on God. But just because our churches were closed or are closed does not mean God is limited to be near us, to be with us and to affect our lives, to change our lives. He is with us at our bedside. He is with us when we are at the park. He is with us when we're driving our car. He is with us when we're sitting on the sofa watching TV. Sure, it's nice to gather in community in church, but when the church is closed, God is still in control. So let's not be confined to a building. Let's not label God as not in control or not powerful enough. After all, Jesus gave his life on the cross so we could have our sins forgiven. He gave his life so that label, the labels people place on us wouldn't be important. If we believe and have faith, we will be saved from our sins. That's the only understanding we have to know. So during this pandemic, it can feel like we're stuck because churches have closed, but God is not stuck. He is still active and ready and willing to help each one of us. You know, it's funny, even online, I get more attraction, more people view this than that come to my church, come to our church. And so we're, more people are seeing this who would never walk through our door. So God can use whatever he wants to use to grow his kingdom for the better. But today, maybe you feel stuck. Maybe you feel like you're limited by a label you were born into or were given. Your life, your potential, who you can be, have become, and have become feels limited because of the kind of family you were born into. Maybe you feel labeled because of where you live or maybe how much money you have or even your age. But here's what I think is the absolute 100% truth. We may not be able to change the labels placed on us or the labels we place on ourselves or the situations we live in or the challenges we face or the difficulties we're going through, but God can change them. He can do things that we can't even imagine. His power is limitless. And because of that, the potential for our life is also limitless. 
You see, God isn't limited by our labels or our sins, and he doesn't want us to be limited either. And because God isn't limited, we're free to do something different. We're free to make different choices, to hang out with different people, to dream about a future that no one would expect. We're free to turn our lives over to him, to seek forgiveness, and finally experience true grace, true peace, true hope, and true love that can only come from him and be put in our life. Today, even if you can't imagine a life beyond the limits of our labels, just consider this idea that with God, the possibilities for our life are limitless. There is something more that God can show us that even we don't really understand. So ask yourself, since God's power is unlimited, what could he do with my life? I'll ask you, what can he do with your life? What can he do with our church? What can he do with our ministry in the world? How can he affect my faith? How can he lead me in the what and what he wants me to do? Sure, it's nice to gather together in church, but we can meet God where we are right now. I want us to dream big. I want us to go right past the limits of what we've always thought is possible. Because like Moses, like Moses, God has a great plan for our lives. And I know he has a plan for our church and for all the churches in our world. And I know he has the power to make that plan happen without limits, without restrictions, and without uh, compromising what we believe and the faith we have. You know, I know there's some of you out there this morning who are sick and hurting. I know there's some of you who have never given your life to Jesus. I know that uh, times can be scary, but if you give your life over to Christ right now, he will change you. He'll forgive your sins, and no matter what you go through, you'll have a place in his, his kingdom, and he'll provide you grace and peace and understanding that you will not imagine, you cannot imagine. You know, it's difficult, but I know with him, all things are possible. And this morning, if you'd like to give your life to Christ, all you have to say is, God, I believe in you. I believe that your son died on a cross for my sins. And I give my life over to you. Forgive me for all that I've done wrong and help me to be better. Help me to grow. Help me to be a follower of you. Forgive me for all that I've done. I believe in you and I know you are my God. And folks, if you said that this morning, you have given your life to Christ. And if you have said that and if you believe that, I want you to put a thumbs up symbol or a happy face. Let me know that uh, you believe that God is your uh, king and that Jesus died on the cross for you. I pray that you'll feel his blessing this week. I pray that he'll lay his, lay his hand upon you and give you the comfort you need. And I pray that you'll just experience something new and know that God is unlimited in what he can do in your life. In a moment or two, we're going to hear a song from uh, Terry Barker. And as you do, I just want you to contemplate on it. You can sing along. There's no words, unfortunately. But if you know those words, you can sing along to them. And I just want you to uh, enjoy this moment as a moment of peace and comfort and uh, consider God in your life today. Amen. This is for Captain Karen. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every hour I need you My one defense 
my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Sin run is deep, your grace is more, where grace is found is where you Thank you for joining us this morning. I want to thank Terry Barker for the great songs he sang. We are truly blessed to have him uh, do that for us on the last two Sundays, and I hope to use him more as we go further down the road. But I, I also want to thank you for uh, joining in this morning. I know this is a different way to worship, but I think it can be a meaningful way. And so we don't limit God and how he can affect our lives, and how he can change our lives, even though it's across the internet. I know he is more powerful than we can ever imagine, and uh, we don't have to be really in church. We can be where we are, and he'll meet us in those moments. And so I just want to encourage you to reach out to him in prayer. Uh, if you have a concern or what, or a challenge in your life, or you'd like to talk, just add me as a Facebook friend and uh, message me. And uh, I can message you back and we can connect together. Again, if you uh, want prayer, if there's something that's going on in your life, you don't want to announce it. But if you just want a prayer, let me mention you in prayer, my prayer time. Just put the prayer hands up and, uh, on a message below and, and I'll remember you in my prayers each and every uh, day as we continue on. And so right now, just let me pray with you and as we uh, finish off this uh, worship time this morning. Father God, just bless those people who have heard and, and uh, spent their time just uh, worshiping with you this morning. I pray that you bless their lives, meet their needs, and uh, let their light shine in this world. And if someone who doesn't know you, uh, may they give their life over to you even now. I pray you just dismiss us in your love. In Christ Jesus, your son's name, amen. Now may God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. And may his hope lift you up and give you what you need to get through your day 
And may you be open to the Holy Spirit in your life. Praise God. And uh, until we meet again.